Good evening and wel welcome to tonight's webinar. I'm Tasha Bunch, Program Director at the Institute for Intellectual Property and Social Justice. Thank you so much for joining us for tonight's webinar, Careers in Patent Law for Engineers, which is the third webinar in our new series, IP for the People. If you missed the prior webinars, you can check out the videos on our YouTube page. Just search for the Institute's name. In particular, you all may be interested in last month's presentation, Patent Law for Engineers. And if you miss any of tonight's presentation, we'll send you a link to the video and any slides that are shown within a couple weeks of the program. And now I'll turn the program over to our moderator for tonight's webinar, Abigail Edo Kogi, who is a student at Howard University School of Law. Abigail? Thank you, Tasha. Hi, everyone. Good evening. My name is Abigail Dokagi. Um, I am a third year law student here at Howard University School of Law in Washington, D.C., and I'm so excited to be joining you today <laughs> as the moderator of today's event. So today's webinar topic is careers in patent law for engineers. The purpose of today's webinar is to expose students and engineering professionals from underrepresented groups to career opportunities in the field of patent law. Our panel today includes individuals that are working in different roles within the patent ecosystem. We'll have a short Q&A and then learn more about the different career paths that each of these panelists have taken. And additionally, at the end, the panelists will discuss different diversity, equity, and inclusion programs that they have available for those who are interested in pursuing a career in patent law. And without any further ado, I'll begin with our first question. So, panelists, could you please introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about yourselves, your educational background, and the type of work you do. Hi, good evening, everyone. I am Ayana Marshall, and I'm a patent data analyst at Harity and Harity. Um, my educational background includes a bachelor's and master's degree in electrical engineering, as well as a PhD in biomedical engineering. And I have been working in the patent field for about 12 years. I am um, a boy mom, wife and boy mom of two, and I love cooking, particularly dishes from my home island of Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you, Ayana. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Scott Burwell. I am a partner at the law firm Finnegan, Henderson, Faribault, Garrett, and Dunner, which is a mouthful, so we just go by Finnegan for short. Uh, I have a bachelor's degree in biology from a liberal arts college, but I have not let that stop me from uh, practicing patent law in the life sciences field. I litigate uh, patent cases on behalf of branded pharmaceutical companies. Uh, so that means that when one of my clients has a patent that is uh, being infringed by a competitor, we file a lawsuit and uh, defend the validity of the patent and uh, try to prove that the accused infringer uh, does indeed infringe uh, our client's patent uh, in an effort to either get injunctive relief, which means that they will not be able to market their proposed product uh, or and or to obtain uh, monetary damages as well. Uh, I have been practicing next year will make 30 years. Uh, I started when I was four years old. Not really, uh, but <laughs> it's, it's a long, long time. Uh, and I really enjoy what I do. And uh, I should mention that I am also the partner in charge of diversity, equity and inclusion at my firm. Uh, and one of my passions is to uh, expose the uh, next generation uh, of students to careers in IP law. And that's why I'm delighted to be part of this panel. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is David Pointer. I'm a partner at Thomas Horstemeyer here in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, I went to the University of Texas uh, and I received a double um, degree there and I went to law school at LSU. Uh, before law school, I worked for a large semiconductor company as a technical sales rep. I now I primarily practice in patent prosecution. Uh, and what that entails, um, I work with inventors to understand their designs, uh, and then I describe their designs and text, uh, making sure it's technically accurate, and also taking into consideration each of strategic objectives uh, that the inventors or the company may have. Uh, and I am, uh, I have twins at home, uh, and that's that's a little bit about me. Thanks. 
Hi, my name is Devin Grant. I am Senior Patent Counsel at Visa. I've been a practicing attorney for about 20 years now. I have a double E degree from Georgia Tech and a law degree from the illustrious Howard University School of Law. Um, my practice currently is primarily portfolio management where we uh, where I coordinate with our uh, inventors and our engineers um, and go through their disclosures and make patent filing decisions or trade secret decisions. Um, along those lines, a, a wide range of other um, issues or legal issues related to IP, whether it's dealing with investments or acquisitions, uh, standards, open source, uh, a wide range of uh, issues fall into uh, our lap. And outside of work, I also have twins. So that keeps me busy as well. And um, that's it for me. Thank you guys so much for sharing a little bit about yourselves. And as you can tell, um, it seems as though you guys take up unique spaces within the, eco um, the patent ecosystem. So I would like to ask, how did you decide on what exactly you wanted to do within the patent law field? We can start from the way we started or we can go with Devin. I can go first. Um, how I decided was primarily through my summer clerkships. Um, I mean, I had an idea that I wanted to do patent law. And um, so I went into my summer uh, at the law firms that I summered with, uh, with that mindset, but given the opportunities to work in different departments, it also exposed me to other possibilities or opportunities. And from there, I had an understanding of, um, you know, corporate law as well. And I was looking for that blend of IP and corporate. So once I graduated, that was what I was, you know, overall pursuing, but I had understanding that I had to have the fundamentals of uh, patent law and prosecution as well to be able to accomplish that goal. I'll go next. Um, so I did not really know that patent law was a thing until I got to law school. Um, when I was in college, I decided to major in biology because I wanted to be a doctor. Uh, my father was a doctor and I wanted to follow in his footsteps. Uh, so I took all of the math and science classes uh, along the pre-med track uh, and then realized midway through after a summer job at a hospital that I was just not cut out to be a doctor. Um, it was just way too stressful uh, having people's, even as a college kid, I was not actually having people's lives in my hands, but uh, looking around at the uh, the type of work that actual physicians were doing, I quickly realized that I was not cut out for it. I also was not the best uh, student in the laboratory, uh, so a career in research was probably not in the offing for me as well. Uh, so I ended up going to law school because uh, they tell you that you can do anything with a law degree. Uh, and so I figured I'd go to law school after college to uh, buy some more time to figure out what it is I wanted to be when I grew up. And during my first year of law school, I was reading a uh, little magazine that they had in the dining hall uh, for files of attorneys. And one of the attorneys had a background similar to mine. He um, was pre-med undergrad, decided he didn't want to become a doctor and uh, landed in patent law. And I said, oh, that sounds interesting. Uh, I always enjoyed science, even though I realized I was not going to become a doctor or a researcher. So I said, oh, here's something that I can do in the legal field that will combine my interest in science with the law. So I ended up getting a summer associate position with this uh, person's firm uh, after my first year of law school and really enjoyed that experience. I was also interested in other areas of the law as well. And so for my second summer, I went to a general practice firm that does uh, everything under the sun uh, and tried out some corporate work and some tax work and some general litigation as well. Uh, ended up going back to that firm upon graduating from law school. But after about a year of trying various areas, rotating through different departments, I realized that patent law was 
what I was truly passionate about. Uh, and at that time, decided to make the jump to a firm that did only intellectual property law. Uh, and uh, having made that decision, I've just been uh, ha had amazing opportunities to try different aspects of patent law, whether it's patent prosecution or litigation. And over a period of several years, gravitated to doing exclusively litigation. Uh, so that's uh, my path to what I'm doing today. So um, I have a, a somewhat similar um, start, like Scott, as Scott did. Um, so for me, I actually went to a conference when I was in graduate school, and this one lady was talking about technology transfer, and she was so enthusiastic, and she loved it so much. I kind of stepped over and I asked her, so what, what is that? Could you tell me a little bit more about it? And she spoke about patents and licensing and all the different aspects to her career. And that really piqued my curiosity because what I discovered was that during an internship at undergrad, like I did like hardcore electrical engineering internships. And then um, during my doctoral degree, I did research and I was doing human, um, human subjects research and working on medical devices. And I realized that I'm not sure that either was the path for me but I wanted somewhere where I could still use my technical skills because because I love diving into the technical stuff. I love those aspects, the intellectual side of things that I didn't want to lose that. So um, I started really exploring the patent field. And what I found is that looking at the technology and just diving into all the different aspects of the technology and just going into our patents and getting into the nuts and bolts of it was really, really interesting to me and really excited me. So I was able to get a patent researcher, patent analyst role um, very early on. And that's where I started. And that kind of propelled me into my current patent data analytics position. Yeah, and for, for me, um, I first, when I was an undergrad, I first attended a kind of patent law seminar. And um, when I was in sitting in that session, I thought this sounded like amazing, but I, I just wasn't ready to sign up to go to law school, <laughs> right, while I was still finishing my engineering degree. Um, so I kind of dismissed the idea, but it at least planted the seed that this was an opportunity that I could, you know, think about later. Um, so I went and started working um, in, at a semiconductor company, and I was doing that for about four or five years, and I, I really enjoyed that. And one aspect that I found that I enjoyed the most was kind of learning about all my different clients and their different kind of uh, technologies that they were developing. Um, I had a chance to kind of work with tech, you know, technology companies all over New England. And after about four or five years of that, I was thinking about what do I really want to do next? What do I what am I really passionate about? And I thought a lot about, you know, just I, I'm really in love with technology and learning about new technology. Uh, and so I went back and I was thinking about that you know, patent law, becoming a patent attorney from when I attended that seminar. And I kind of instantly started thinking about who do I know that's in that field. And I started to just talk to some of the guys that I knew uh, that were a little bit ahead of me in, in engineering school to kind of figure out, you know, hey, do you enjoy uh, what you're doing as a patent attorney? Do you enjoy the work and what do you do? Uh, and from that, those conversations that I've had with them, I thought this would be a great opportunity as a next step for, for me as a career. Thank you, everybody. Um, I de definitely understand as a law student and someone with a science background as well, being able to kind of put the two and two together because they don't instinctively go together. You kind of have to have someone expose you to it. So I definitely agree. But um, to pivot a little bit, all of you guys are really successful in your careers. But when you were just on the onset, what did you find was the most challenging aspect about getting started in your career? I think for me, it was finding someone who would take a chance on me because I didn't have a law degree. I wanted to get into the patent space and having the background that I had, a lot of times I would get the question, so why pivot into this kind of patent space? Why, you know, why, um, you know, you have a PhD, so why not just use that and become a professor or, you know, become a researcher and go down the traditional PhD path? And what I, what I found is that I just had to really be persistent and I also had to be creative. So what I did was that I actually got um, 
an internship, an unpaid internship, having graduated, I was like, I, I'm ready to work and make my money. But I made the sacrifice and got an unpaid internship at the National Institutes of Health in their technology transfer office. And that opportunity opened up a number of different um, paths for me in, in the um, space. But I think my biggest challenge was just getting someone to say, hey, your, your, your qualifications could map into becoming um, someone in a patent field. So for me, I think initially a big challenge was, frankly, overcoming the imposter syndrome. Uh, as I mentioned, I've got a bachelor's degree in biology from a liberal arts college, and a lot of folks at my firm have PhDs and have been clinical uh, laboratory researchers for a decade before changing career paths and deciding to go to law school to become patent lawyers. And so technically, they know more than I do. Uh, and I had to um, accept that while I didn't necessarily have the same level of technical expertise as they did, uh, I still belonged. Uh, the, the firm hired me for a reason. And uh, I have found that one of the keys is to not be afraid uh, to learn new things, to learn new technology. And even though you may not have studied it in undergrad or in graduate school, uh, there are ways to pick things up. Uh, sometimes it's by necessity. Uh, and uh, other times you will find very patient, helpful people that will sit down with you and give you a crash course and what you need to know in order to be able to speak confidently uh, about particular technical subject matter. And then part of it is also just a lot of self-study. Um, similarly, there are lots of folks at my firm who were patent examiners before deciding to go to law school. So they knew the ins and outs of the patent law um, much more so than I did. When I was in law school, patent law was not nearly as big as it is now. And my law school did not offer a class in patent law. Uh, so I had to do a lot of on-the-job learning uh, of the substantive uh, legal aspects as well, uh, which, again, just required a lot of self-study, a lot of patient, uh, experienced lawyers who were willing to invest their time into me. Uh, so overcoming that initial feeling of, do I really belong here, uh, was a challenge. Um, but my advice to students is always, there's a reason you were hired by a law firm, uh, because they believe in you. And if they didn't, they would not uh, bring you in in the first place. So uh, reassure yourself that you do indeed belong uh, and try uh, as best you can to overcome that. That, uh, that sense of uh, imposter syndrome. Uh, I'd piggyback on what Scott said as far as imposter syndrome as well, because it happened to some extent to myself, especially when you're going in as a first year associate um, and you're looking at the the rankings and you're the the sole person from Howard and you're in in a room room full of people from you know Harvard and Georgetown and George Washington it's a bit intimidating but you know as Scott said you're there for a reason um one additional challenge was having an understanding or being able to adapt fast enough uh for uh you, when you're working with different people they have different expectations and different um, idiosyncrasies and having picking up on those as quick as possible so that your work product is acceptable or even better than acceptable to each partner that you're working for is very, um, very helpful. And having an understanding that there are differences that usually comes from, you know, working with other uh, senior associates in the group that have experience with different partners that that'll get you uh, up to speed on what you need to do to uh, get that work product in in a timely and acceptable manner. 
Yeah, and I'll echo on what um, Scott and Devin said. I, I agree. I, I had the issue of the imposter syndrome and, and just managing uh, different expectations for different uh, opportunities that you're reporting to. And then I'll add another one to just kind of maintaining um, confidence in yourself and your abilities uh, in that. Because as you go through the, you know, as you're starting out, there's a lot you have to learn on the job and, and it can be uh, overwhelming at times. And so just maintaining confidence in yourself and your abilities uh, that, you know, just try not to make the same mistake and keep learning as you go. Uh, and, and that will help you, uh, accelerate on your learning curve. Uh, so I think that was, um, a big one for me is just maintaining confidence in yourself and your abilities to keep plugging away and keep going, uh, and you'll get, you'll get there eventually. All right. Thank you guys. I can definitely hear how imposter syndrome can be quite the beast, but it's not hard to tame with a little bit of practice and support. So um, I also want to be able to open up questions to anybody in the audience. If not, I have some more predetermined questions that I can continue along with. So I'll wait for a moment to see if anyone has any questions. All right, we'll keep rolling. Um, so one thing I hear mentioned often is the interviewing process when you're beginning your career. I think all of you guys mentioned kind of getting your foot into the door and how, so I guess my question is, how would you suggest marketing your prior work in education and technical backgrounds to firms and companies that may be able to set you apart from other candidates? I can start with this one. Uh, so I was the hiring partner for my firm from 2015 to 2019. And the resumes that I saw, <clears throat> excuse me, that um, really caught my eye were the people who had shown on paper, because that's what you're seeing first. Before you meet the actual person, you're going to see that piece, piece of paper that they've generated. And I was looking for something there that demonstrated a commitment to IP law. Um, and I didn't expect them to have prior experience uh, in IP law. Most of the candidates that we get do have a technical background, so it's very common to see uh, organizations that they've been in involved in uh, scientifically and the research that they may have done in undergrad or in grad school. Um, but I want to see something that shows that they are interested in IP law. So even if you have no prior experience, Experience, um, something that signals that you want to do this uh, in, in in a career. So, some sort of student organization that has some connection with patents or intellectual property, uh, or you know, a, a paper that you may have written uh, that has something to do with intellectual property. Uh, something that shows that you're really committed to this area of the law. Uh, on the technical side, uh, just Give as much detail as you can uh, if you've written a thesis or if uh, you're in a PhD program and are working on a dissertation. Definitely include citations to papers that you've written, uh, research that you've done, if you've worked in industry to the extent that you can uh, disclose uh, information that's not confidential confidential to your employer, uh, you know, general discussion of the types of activities that you've been involved in. If you've done capstone projects uh, in undergrad, uh, identify those. Uh, but something that uh, illustrates that you have the interest in the field and the technical uh, background in order to um, make your way in in the profession. And it's not necessary that you've solved all the world's problems in whatever field of science that you're studying, uh, but something that shows that uh, it's something that you enjoy and are committed to. Yeah, I, I would say um, in terms of marketing yourself, you can probably do a little bit of homework and see if you can find um, which type of firms are, are 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 kind of right doing work for a certain type of company. So if you have a background that's relevant to a certain company and you know this firm does work for that kind of company or that, at least that industry, 
um, you can try to target yourself to those firms, maybe certain partners, and you can email them directly or at least um, apply to the firm's kind of um, general um, hiring um, intake process. Um, so I would suggest, you know, if, do, if doing some research to kind of see which type of firms are doing which type of working with certain type of industries or what type of uh, companies that they're working with. Yeah, and I'll, I'll also add that um, if you have the opportunity to submit like a cover letter or a writing sample, those are other places where you can showcase your skill set as well and provide, you know, a lot of technical background that on the cover letter, you can also give that um, IP experience that Scott talked about. Do we have any um, more? I mean, the only thing I would add on, on top of what everyone has said is, you know, in addition to your industry and your, your papers and your academics, also remember the activities that you might have done um, in your extracurricular activities as well. Because I know when I um, had a interview for my first summer, the the conversation came up on with um, a project that I had that was extracurricular for uh, the first robotics competition and how we were designing robots for the competition with a with a high school and that took about ten minutes of the my interview. So not only what you're doing academically and from a a career perspective, but also some of the um, extra relevant extracurricular activities might be helpful as well. Thank you. Um, so moving on to our next question. So many of you are attorneys are work for law firms. And as you know, engineers as well as other STEM students are brilliant, but not typically notable for their technical writing skills. How should someone interested in the patent space develop this very vital skill? I think the thing that comes to mind for me is practice. So the more you do it, the better you get at it, but also getting substantive feedback from someone who's also a good technical writer. And another thing that you could consider is getting writing coaching from, from an actual, um, someone whose profession is coaching in writing. So those are the, the two things that I would mention. Yeah, definitely practice. Uh, there's no substitute for practice. And uh, in the litigation sphere, uh, persuasive writing is very, very different from technical writing. Um, and we have to, when we have uh, new associates come in who have had uh, careers uh, as scientists, uh, before deciding to make the jump to law school and, and changing professions, uh, they have been trained in scientific writing, which is often uh, very heavily passive voice and often very equivocal because uh, the data often only suggests a conclusion. Uh, so they have to be very careful about uh, staking out a very strong position uh, depending on the results of the experiments that they've done. As a litigator, you're an advocate. Uh, and it's your job in the legal writing to convince the judge that uh, she should rule in favor of your client. And you need to be very emphatic about that. And of course, you need the evidence to back up what it is that you're saying, but you need to use active voice. You need to uh, write in a way that suggests that you're not being equivocal and eh, it could go this way. It might go the other way. Uh, you need to be very confident in your arguments and make them forcefully. Uh, and that's a skill that does not come easily, particularly to people that have uh, spent years writing in a different fashion. Uh, so kind of unlearning what you've learned in a scientific career and then learning how to write as an advocate is critically important. And, you know, what they don't tell you um, in, in law school, and you don't realize it until you actually start practicing, is that the lawyers that you see on TV 
uh, that's not really what we do on a daily basis. Uh, yeah, I go to court every now and again, but 90% of my life is spent outside of court writing briefs and, and writing motions. And uh, by the time you get to court, you've already submitted so much paperwork to the court and the judge will have read that. And typically she's made up her mind uh, based on the written submissions and then the oral argument, which is the stuff that you see on TV, uh, is really only to uh, kind of nail down that last 10 percent of any doubt that still may be in the judge's mind. Uh, so writing is critically important to what we do. Uh, and effective writers have a big advantage. So as Ayana mentioned, uh, getting writing coaching can be invaluable and then just practicing. And to the extent that you have the opportunity, uh, whether if you're still in school, take a creative writing class. Uh, might not have anything to do with legal writing or scientific writing, but the more writing of any type that you do, the better a writer you'll become. Yeah, I, I would agree. I, I don't have much else to add to that. I, I think they've kind of summed it up pretty well. Um, just getting as much practice as possible and, and getting good feedback, good substantive feedback is, is definitely um, huge, huge to help you advance and, and learn from your mistakes. I agree. I mean, all the points are essentially made. I mean, if, if, you can't get to the creative writing classes, start with the technical writing. As I know, um, as an engineer, I was, you know, vehemently against writing in general. So just doing, you know, the technical specifications or or any kind of documentation is is a is a start. And then from there, you know, continue along the the creative lines as was mentioned before and get coaching and feedback as well. Thank you, everyone. Um, so my next question is, how important are mentors in the patent space? And how would you advise someone looking for such mentorship to find, select, and then approach these type of relationships? So I, I think mentoring is, is it's, it's important. It definitely is can be very impactful if you have the right mentor. Um, I think, but what what we need to, you know, what you need to be mindful of is that you're you, you're building a network, right? So we're thinking mentor, but think also ally and think also sponsor and think like creating that quote unquote board of directors who could help you in your professional career and help elevate you. And even just on your in your day to day life, if you have any kinds of questions, build like that kind of network that would really help facilitate and accommodate you being able to be as successful of a practitioner as possible. So I, I think being able to really have like a, a little bit of a diverse group of advisors is helpful. Yes, mentor for sure, but then having all of those other pieces really just do help in building your network. And I, I think the way to find that is really to get involved, get involved in different capacities. Like if you, and, and especially if you like, you want to elevate and get promoted, you know, if you, you see that you want to be partner someday, then try to network and connect with a partner. You know, it's all about building true relationship, true professional relationship. It's not just about just like, you know, I have this mentor and I'm just going to ask and all of these questions. But it's all about like building that kind of rapport and have like a real relationship. So getting involved in different professional organizations, getting involved in organizations, even at your firm, I think are pretty um, helpful as well in order to find the mentor. And, and select the mentor based on what you're looking for. The position that you want to be in as well is a good criteria that you can use. Yeah, I, I would just, I think uh, Ayana summed it up well, and I would just add just to, to be assertive and, and don't be afraid to reach out to people that you really don't have a formal um, relationship with and, and just, just take a swing at it and say, hey, this person seems like they're doing something that I would love to do. 
uh, reach out and see if they'll have 20 minutes to talk to you. And, and don't um, think of it as you have to have a formal um, mentoring relationship, but just to have a conversation and see if, because that conversation may give you a, one or two tidbits that may help you expand your mind, expand your thoughts and, and kind of take you in a different direction that you weren't kind of aware of. Um, and so it's, it's a journey for sure. Um, and just be assertive, make a plan uh, and, and just find, like Ayana was saying, find different people that can probably help you get to where you want to be. I would agree. And I mean, I would also add that I would not just hold it to, to one mentor. Um, there are different mentors, kind of you, you need a mentor of where you are now to navigate what you're doing now, because you have an older mentor that's kind of your overall, I want to be here in 10 years, but I've lost track of how it actually is where you are as well as things have changed over the last decade. So having someone that can navigate what you're doing now, but also someone that can help you navigate in the long long term is also valuable. And you know, for me, um, relying on alumni was very helpful, especially as a summer, um, going into some of the firms that had um, Howard alum. Um, they were, I mean, that was the first person I, I went to 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 seek help or get information on who you know what to do when to do it and how to do it and things like that i i completely agree with the points that everyone else has made and and i'll just echo david's point about being assertive i mean that's just key don't be shy don't sit around and wait for a mentor to come to you go out and find a mentor and sometimes it's cold calling uh, go on the uh, websites of law firms that do the type of work you want to do and find somebody whose practice sounds interesting and shoot them an email or pick up the phone and call and ask for 15 or 20 minutes of their time over Zoom. And you might not get it tomorrow, but you might get it next week. Uh, we're all very busy, but uh, particularly for underrepresented folks in the field and in the field of patent law especially, there's not too many of us. Um, there's a pipeline issue with people having STEM backgrounds. Uh, and if you look at these statistics, uh, black and brown folks are way underrepresented in the field of patent law. And that's one of the reasons that I'll make 20 minutes for anybody. Uh, you know, I, I get cold calls from law students or undergrads saying, hey, can you tell me a little bit about what you do? And I'm like, yeah, definitely. Again, it might not be tomorrow, but I will find time within the next few weeks to uh, catch up with you by Zoom or if you're local, go out and grab some coffee and just tell you about what I do. Uh, I, I didn't have somebody when I was in undergrad or law school to uh, do that for me. And now that I'm in a position where I can do that for others, uh, I love to do it. So, uh, But it takes the initiative of the student to reach out and find me and uh, ask for the opportunity. So don't be shy. Uh, uh, IP attorneys are generally very nice people. Uh, so, and, and we're willing to help out to those uh, who are coming up uh, in that next generation. And I think I, I'd like to also add that in terms of like a, a mentor, remember you're building a relationship. So it's not like you're going to jump out there. Hey, be my mentor, please. It's, hey, what are you doing? I'm interested in what you're doing and build that relationship. And when you're going into, like, if a mentor carves out 20 minutes, 15 minutes for you, go in there prepared, having at least some idea of what you want to get out of that meeting. Because that, you know, as, as Scott said, the, the time is, is valuable and he can carve that time out. But ensure that you go out, go in there knowing, at least having an idea of what you're trying to get out of the meeting. So. Yeah, and I'll add one more point that I, that I heard someone suggest as a good idea is that if you're kind of seeking out mentorships and, and see if there's a way in which you can probably add value to the person you're um, asking advice. I mean, that may not always be the case, but maybe you can do some homework for them or do some research for them. And, and if there's a way in which you can help give them some value as well, that may be another way to uh, continue the relationship as Ayana is saying. Thank you so much for that invaluable information. I heard a lot about a diversified director, board of directors, as well as making sure that our relationships are two ways and not just one way um, and kind of having intentional relationships as well. Um, so moving right along, uh, let's 
talk about a happier note. What is something that you enjoy about your current roles? Well, I enjoy the aha moments, just to take a little quote from Oprah, the aha moments, because when you're looking at just volumes and volumes of data and you go in with a little hint of a perspective of what you think you might see. And, and when you crunch the data and you realize, hey, there's something a little bit more interesting here, that is something that really thrills me. And then the other aspect of it is just looking at the technology and seeing who is doing what in what space, because there are like millions of patents at this point. And so every, if you look at a patent, I don't know if you know, you've ever seen a patent before, but every aspect of the patent is a data point to me. So you have an inventor on there. Who are the key inventors? You have, um, you know, you have like a patent date, like who's been patenting in this technology at a certain date and time? What are the patenting trends? Like, I just love being able to dive into that data and come out with the insights that are meaningful to the client. And for me, I that is that is the aspect that I really am thrilled by, that I really enjoy and that I continue to love and keeps me going to work every day. For me, it's uh, diversity. So the diversity of interactions. So on a day-to-day -day basis, I'm interacting with other attorneys. I'm interacting with the business groups. I'm interacting with uh, engineers and HR as well. And each of those have different priorities and different mindsets. And you have to have an understanding that you have to address them in different manners. Um, you know, some are more direct, some are less direct, some have different issues and some don't, as well as kind of the diversity of issues that I have to deal with on a day-to-day -day base, basis. And you, what you might think you're doing for that day would can go completely out the window um, on a phone call. And I've had situations where it's been, you know, I'm, I'm supposed to be looking at this patent or figuring out if we're going to file on this decision and you get a phone call and say, hey, we just bought this company, go through their portfolio, see what's relevant, see if there are any issues. And, you know, at that point, everything drops and, and you're off to, a, you know, another task. So all of that diversity on a day-to-day -day basis are, is, is what I enjoy. Yeah, I would say um, as someone who practices in the patent prosecution space, I, I like working in the, the diverse um, fields of technology. Uh, so one day I may be working on a software application and, and then you see um, that it's eventually gets developed and it's out in, this, in, out in the public and just seeing that, hey, you kind of know how that works or that you understand how that's uh, the functionality of that works. And then the next day I may be working on a, on a product that's in Home Depot or something. So just being able to kind of understand the underlying technology between all these tech, all these um, kind of products and services that are out there in the public uh, is very interesting and very fascinating to me. So. Yeah, I have similar thoughts as well. I mean, the, the aha moment when you are taking a deep dive into technology and, and you figure out how things work or, or visiting a client. I was at a client's headquarters yesterday uh, and just talking to the attorneys and the scientists there about the next big thing that is under development uh, and just to, discovering the really cool stuff that uh, scientists are working on, but then also realizing that they need help in protecting those inventions uh, and uh, and one day enforcing uh, patents uh, against uh, companies that may try to infringe those patents. Uh, so the opportunity to work on the cutting edge technically as well as legally is just really exciting to be. And then the opportunity to work with really, really brilliant folks Folks. I've had cases where uh, we've had expert witnesses who have won the Nobel Prize in chemistry. Uh, I had a case a couple of years ago where our expert was awarded the Nobel Prize in the middle of the case. Uh, I woke up one morning, uh, I checked the news and saw that our expert had uh, won the Nobel Prize for work on antibodies. And the first thought that came to mind was, well, he needs to wear his medal to court so the jury will be able to see him uh, wearing his big gold Nobel Prize medal. Uh, the case ended up settling uh, before we got that far. But uh, having the opportunity to sit at the elbow of people who are at the forefront of the, the science 
but then realizing that as this person knew more about uh, chemistry and antibodies than I will ever know, uh, but I knew the law. And it took both of us in order to put these arguments together. And it was my job to take this uh, high level technical information and translate it, simplify it in a way that the judge or the jury will be able to understand. Uh, so it's the teamwork approach uh, combining the technical skills and the legal skills that I find just really exciting. If there was ever a panel to romanticize patent law, this was the group to do it. You guys make patent law sound like something straight out of television because, wow, um, I was very, very pleased to hear about how patent analysis can create this sort of aha moment and how, you know, in-house you do a lot of diverse work with the assets and even the assets of human assets of working with different people. Um, and then just even from the prosecution side to the litigation side, there's just so much work to be done in the patent space. But um, as you guys also mentioned, there are also some disparities in representation within the patent law space. So this will be our shift into our diversity, equity, and inclusion programs that are offered by some of our fabulous panelists, and I'll allow them each time to speak about it, starting with Frank. I mean, sorry, starting with Scott. <laughs> Thank you so much. So uh, one of our newest initiatives is what we call Finnegan IP University. Uh, we launched it this past uh, spring uh, and um, it is a five week virtual program uh, that's free. Uh, and it's designed to expose careers in intellectual property law to undergrads in the STEM field or grad students uh, in in a way that uh, I certainly wish that I had when uh, I was an undergrad. You know, as I mentioned uh, at the beginning, I didn't really know that patent law was a thing until I had gotten to law school. But had I had this opportunity as a college student, uh, I would have uh, realized much more quickly that this was a potential career path besides just trying to be a doctor or a researcher. So it's a five-week program. We start with a session much like uh, today's panel where we talk about career opportunities in IP. Uh, and then over the next four weeks after that, we give an overview uh, into what patents are, what patent law is all about, and then the aspects of drafting patent applications, drafting the claims, which is his own uh, very complex uh, aspect of patent law and is frankly, the most important part of the patent are the patent claims, uh, because that's what defines the invention and uh, uh, becomes the protectable patent right. Uh, and then prosecuting the patent application, the back and forth between the applicant and the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. Uh, so it's a uh, five-week uh, program, and upon completion, we give you a certificate, so we give you a badge that you can put on your LinkedIn profile. Uh, we have mentoring opportunities from the faculty members uh, who are displayed here on this uh, slide that Abigail has put up. And then we also use this as a pipeline to recruit uh, technical specialists to our firm. Technical specialists are uh, people with uh, scientific training, whether in undergrad or grad school, who have not yet uh, gone to law school, uh, but may be considering law school in the future. And they are involved in working on uh, patent prosecution matters. They can get involved in litigation, uh, oftentimes working directly with the scientists because uh, they have... Uh, typically more current scientific knowledge than the attorneys uh, like myself who have uh, been out of school for 30 plus years. So uh, it's a wonderful program. We will be uh, having the second session coming up uh, in early 2023. We don't have the dates uh, identified just yet, but it will likely be uh, in the February to March timeframe. Uh, and if anyone is interested, feel free to reach out to me and I can put you in touch with uh, the coordinator who uh, takes all the resumes and uh, we can uh, uh, give you much more information at that time. 
Thank you so much, Scott. Um, and I misspoke earlier. We only have two more presentations regarding DEI programs. And the next will be Ayana with Heritage Academy. And thanks, Abigail. So um, in terms of, uh, so we have Parity Academy and we also have Parity for Parity and we have Patent Pathways. So I will just highlight the Harity Academy and um, the Harity for Parity quickly and then but I'll speak a little bit more to the Patent Pathways program. So the Harity Academy really provides an opportunity for our um, participants to get introduction an introduction into the patent field and also an opportunity to learn how to get to draft and prosecute patents. The Harity for Parity is for um, it's a woman only session and it's for four days and it gives the opportunity for similar for drafting and prosecution, but there's also a panel of women who come in to talk about their careers and their journeys and the trajectory that their careers took. So for patent pathways, thanks Abigail, we could switch to the patent pathways slide. So Patent Pathways is a program that came about because what we did as our analytics team is that we, what we found is that there are more men named Michael who are registered at the US Patent and Trademark Office as patent agents and patent attorneys than there are racially diverse women. These statistics kind of worked out to about 2% about two um, of the patent field is racially diverse women. And what we wanted to do was that we actually wanted to create a program that would diversify the patent bar and move the needle quickly. So we published, an article was published by um, one of the members of our analytics team and also um, one of the partners at Harity to talk about the, just the difference in that, um, in that space when regarding the diversity of the patent law. So we created this program called Patent Pathways and it's a one, it's a almost a year long program. And what it, the program involves is, um, it in, entails having, providing women, African-American women with the opportunity to be introduced to patent law, to get patent drafting and um, prosecution skills as well as career readiness training and an opportunity for employment at a law firm. We are very, very excited about this program and we're actually in our first year and um, actually Abigail is one of our participants and we are, we're excited and we're able to do this at no cost to the participants because of the fact that we have some really generous sponsors including corporations and law firms such as Qualcomm and um, Stanley Black and Decker and a few others who really support the program. What is um, another key partnership that we have is with the Practicing Law Institute, and they have also collaborated with us to provide the patent preparation piece of the program. So the goal is this year to have, um, for this year group, to have 20 women take and pass the patent bar. And then we plan to expand the program to 50 African-American women into the 2023-2024 year. So if you are an engineering student or a life science student, or even a law student, a law school student with an engineering or science background, or even just an early career changer, and you're thinking of changing your career, then this program would be um, of interest to you. It's all virtual and it happens after working hours. And um, we have a mentorship component as well where each participant gets one in-house mentor as well as one outside council mentor. So that way the participant has the opportunity to be able to have both perspectives on patents careers as well. So if you are interested in um, participating in the program, you can go to uh, um, patentpathways.org and the applications are open as well as if you have any specific questions you can email us at info at patentpathways.org thank you thank you so much and not to be biased but the patent pathways program has been immensely helpful in just directing me and putting um people in my 
purview and in right directly in my grasp <laughs> to have genuine interest in proliferating people who look like me within the patent space. So if you have the chance, I definitely say to check it out. And moving right along with David. Yeah, so I, I'm here to, I want to just discuss briefly the Sidney B. Williams uh, Junior Scholars Program. Uh, so as I had mentioned that to enter the patent field, you don't have to go to law school. Um, you can pass a patent bar and you can work, get a job um, as a patent agent. Uh, but for those who have the ability or have the, the means um, to go to law school, we want to encourage uh, those from underrepresented minority groups to uh, provide as much assistance and help uh, in going through law school and, and getting started in their career. Uh, so we encourage you as you're going through the application process or while you're going through it to consider applying uh, for this scholars program. Uh, so some of the benefits that you can receive include um, financial assistance for a variety of different aspects uh, from, you know, assistance with your um, law school application um, fees, uh, some assistance with the patent bar, you know, taking the patent bar, uh, assistance uh, with a tuition grant. Uh, and there's also other components to the program as well in terms of once you're selected, uh, you can also, we also have mentoring, uh, mentoring program where we'll help uh, find you a mentor with a patent, you know, patent professional. Uh, we also provide assistance if you need help finding some sort of internship or summer associate position. We try to help our scholars with uh, align them kind of job opportunities as well. Um, and, uh, and that's, and that's for the most part. Yeah. So if you're interested, we encourage you to apply around the time that you're going to be applying for law school. Uh, we have a rolling admission, so we can still, we still taking, um, applications, um, throughout most of the year, but the earlier you apply, the better chances you have, uh, in getting accepted. Um, and we have a, um, a QR code right there, um, to easily kind of link to the website, or you can go to diversity and IP Thank you so much. And thank all of you for showing these fabulous opportunities for students like me to be able to take advantage of all of the resources that are geared to help propel us in this space. I'll go ahead and stop sharing my screen because I think, okay. Um, and I believe that we have one more question for the panelists. So you're not quite off the hook just yet, um, but close. And honestly, the only question is, what's one piece of advice you wish someone had shared with you when you were just beginning on your career? Um, I'll, I'll just jump in and I'll kind of echo what I said earlier, just to, to be assertive and, and don't uh, wait for uh, opportunities to come to you. Try to make um, make them happen and, and let people know what you're interested in uh, so they can uh, hopefully help you uh, kind of achieve what you're looking to, to go after. So just number one rule is always be assertive and, and try to go after what you want. I'll go next. I think a, a great piece of advice is try as many different things as you can within uh, the field of IP law. Uh, you may come in thinking you only want to do patent prosecution, but don't limit yourself. Try to get involved in some litigation or in some licensing or other corporate IP work. Uh, try it out. Uh, you never know uh, what might grab your interest until you actually try it and take the opportunity to work with as many different people as you can uh, because you can learn something from everyone. Uh, so really try to take a broad approach, particularly early on in your career, uh, and that will give you that uh, broad base uh, that can be used as a foundation as you advance and determine you may want to specialize in one particular area or you may want to remain a generalist uh, during your entire career but uh, have an open mind and and try to get as much experience as you can as quickly as you can um, i'd echo what what scott mentioned understand what your options are um, and how they relate to how you operate in your your practice overall or what you envision as your practice and understand what it takes to achieve each of those options and then from there make a decision active decision to pursue um either an option or, or multiple op options and if they're 
one is foregone at where you are currently, still uh, find other avenues, whether it's uh, pro bono or something like that to um, get that experience so that in the future, if you want to make a move and pursue both options, then you have that uh, that experience under your belt. Yeah, and I think I spoke to this a little bit earlier, but I wish someone had told me how important it is to develop your network and build your relationships sooner rather than later in your career. And um, I think David also spoke about like being willing to kind of volunteer your time, kind of have that in, in that relationship building, connect by also bringing something to the table. And I think that is helpful. Thank you, everyone. It has been a pleasure moderating this evening today. And I'm so glad to see some familiar faces for people who have poured into me. And um, I'm glad to meet some of the new faces as well. And I'm going to turn it back over to Thank you so much, Abigail. And thank you to all of our panelists for a wealth of wonderful information as well as resources um, for everyone that's online tonight. Thank you so much to our attendees for um, joining us tonight. And again, if you missed anything, we will post the video on our YouTube page and we will we'll send out a link within a couple of weeks once it's posted, as well as a link to access the, um, the different materials that were shared about the, uh, the programs. So once again, I wanna thank everyone for a great program tonight and I hope you all have a wonderful evening. Good night.